Welcome again. We're studying the Bible again. Luke's Gospel. So please grab a Bible. Let's turn to Luke chapter 4 and we're looking at verses 1 to 13 as we consider the temptations of Jesus in the desert. So do, do grab a Bible. By the way, this is part one of this series on the temptations of Jesus and in two weeks time we'll do the second and, and final part on this as we look more in depth at the precise temptations that Jesus faced. But this week it's more of a, a general sweep and some, some deep stuff as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that the Spirit led Jesus into the desert, into this wilderness where some really fantastic stuff happened. And Father, we pray also that you would help us to be guided by your Spirit today and in the, all the in the ways that we lead our lives, help, help us to be spirit-led people in a similar way that Jesus was spirit-led on this planet. Help us, we pray. Amen. So let's walk through the passage. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the, in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. And then the next verses go into the sp specific temptations Jesus faced, and there are three. We're gonna skip that this time, and we'll come back to that in a fortnight. Let's go to verse 13 at the end where it says, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. The devil left Jesus until later. Now, please notice some things right from the start here. Look at what is said about Jesus in, in relationship to the Holy Spirit. In verse 1, it says that Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. And it also says that Jesus was led by the Spirit. And this reminds us of the general way that Jesus lived his life when he was walking on this planet. He was living as a man, as, as Christians do today, living as a person on this planet seeking to live to honour God in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we get to the temptations of Jesus in Luke 4, that is exactly how Jesus goes about resisting every temptation. Jesus resists temptation in, the, in a, exactly the same way that we resist temptation as a person seeking to honour God in the power of the Holy Spirit. However, we have to say it's not exactly the same because we have to put keep something else in mind. That Jesus is, yes, he's 100% a man. But alongside that, we have to keep with that that Jesus is 100% God, God the Son through all of this. Now, there are a few questions that go alongside that when we think about temptations and we think about Jesus being God in the flesh and we'll, we'll try and deal with those questions at the end. Also notice something that seems can seem a bit odd here in verse one where it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit in the desert. 
Now, why? Why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus into the desert where it's going to be into the fires of temptation? And it's almost like in the ring with Satan himself. For us, like when it comes to us, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, what you might remember that we we pray that not to be led into temptation. We say we pray, lead us not into temptation. So why is Jesus being led into temptation by the Holy Spirit? Uh, and also, you, there's there's an objection to this where you could say. Why, why is this even a, a thing that happened? It seems like a desert distraction. Jesus has got lots of stuff to do. He's got to live an obedient life. He's got a lot of teaching to get through. He's, he's going to be healing people. And then he's got to go to the cross and, and die for us. So... Why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus into the desert? It seems like a distraction. Wilderness time feels like a waste of time for someone as important as Jesus. But actually, in the Bible, with, with other people, and particularly with Jesus, we see that and, and this can apply to us today as we think about how we are so restricted and we can feel like we're in the wilderness. This, this is not a good time for many of us. What's it all about? Isn't this just a waste of time, these lockdowns and all the rest of it? Is, is wilderness time a waste of time? No. When, when God leads you into the wilderness, if you trust him, there if you trust him in that wilderness god will do something profound something deep in you and that is exactly what happens with jesus in in the wilderness in the desert let's keep going with this why is jesus in the desert why why did the Spirit take Jesus into the desert? A huge reason is so that Jesus could be tempted by the devil. Jesus has been led into the desert so that he can be tempted by the devil. So that we can see who Jesus really is. The temptations tell us a lot about the identity of Jesus. Who is Jesus? Well, what we're going to do is cast our eyes into the desert and see, and, and start to see who is Jesus? Who is this man, Christ Jesus? And what we see in chapter four, and I'll, I'll explain Jesus is the true and better Adam and also Jesus Jesus is the true and better Israel. He is the one to smash Satan to smithereens to to end him. Let me let me explain. First of all, Adam, how is Jesus a better Adam in in Luke chapter 4? We'll go back to Adam in Genesis. In Genesis, Adam has a different situation than the wilderness Jesus is in. You remember? Adam's in a lush garden, the Garden of Eden, and he's got, he's got food and drink, and he's got a human companion, lovely lady called Eve. And there's only one possible way for Adam to sin. However, when Satan tempts Adam, Adam sins, 
Satan wins. This first Adam failed catastrophically. Could Jesus succeed where Adam failed? Could, could Jesus be the better man? Yeah, yeah. Jesus is the true and better Adam, the one we need to represent us. In Luke 4, we see Jesus, the better Adam. So Jesus doesn't have a lush garden that he's in, in Luke 4. Verse 1, Luke 4, verse 1, it says Jesus is in the desert, or you could translate it as the, the wilderness. So Jesus is in the desert, and Jesus has no human companion with him. And Satan offers many different ways for Jesus to sin. For 40 days. But here's the thing Jesus does not sin at all. So, where we've had that Adam sins, Satan wins, now we have Jesus refuses, Satan loses. And by verse 13, Satan gives up and goes. Verse 13, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. So do you see how Jesus is a, the true and better Adam? He does what Adam should have done in the first place. But also Israel, Jesus is the, the true and better Israel. And you might think, well, why, when Jesus is in the desert for 40 days, why are we talking, why does that make us think of Israel? Well, just to simplify it, Israel was in the desert for 40 years. And you get this said over and over again in the Old Testament. So whenever you say to a, a Jew, 40, 40, and you say desert, their, their mind goes back to, oh yeah, 40 years in the desert. Yeah, we know. Yeah, God's people, 40 years in the desert. So when Jesus is 40 days in the desert, any, any Jew is starting to connect 40 desert Jesus to 40 desert Israelites. So yeah, we, we have to be thinking about Israel as we think about these temptations of Jesus. There's, a, there's another link as well, a more, well, a very, very clear link, that actually all of the ways that Jesus answers Satan come from Deuteronomy, chapter 6 to chapter 8. And Don Carson points this out, that all of these responses that Jesus gives in, in these verses from 1 to 13, from Deuteronomy chapter 6 to 8, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 6 to 8, this is a section of the Bible that calls, that's calling Israel to be faithful to God in the wilderness. And here is Jesus showing us exactly how to be faithful to God in the wilderness. So this is why I'm saying when we look at the temptations of Jesus, we have to be thinking about Adam and we have to be thinking about Israel and seeing how Jesus, that they're meant to be representing God, but they, they didn't do it as they should. But here we have Jesus who is the ultimate representative for us before a holy God. Let's just think about Israel for a sec. So, and how Jesus is the true and better Israel. So, Israel, Israel in the desert, what happened to them? For 40 years, as you go through those years, the people of Israel lose the plot. They stop trusting God and they, they sin. In, in various ways. And they, 
they have some things on their side here. So they've got family and friends with them to comfort one another and yet they still sin. They're on the way to the promised land and yet they still sin. Over and over again, Israel failed to be the faithful representatives of God. Could Jesus succeed where Israel had failed? Yeah, absolutely. In Luke 4, Jesus is also in the desert, but in this case, he's alone. He is isolated in the desert, hungry for 40 days. And Satan is focusing his laser beams of temptation on Jesus, just focusing on one man who is totally isolated from other people. How will Jesus cope with this? Will Jesus turn around and blame the Spirit of God and say that you led me out into this desert, to this place of temptation? Would Jesus blame God in that way? And we see not a bit of it. Jesus, at no point does Jesus turn and blame God, the Holy Spirit, for all of this, all of this trouble. What Jesus does say to the devil over and over again is, is this kind of thing. I mean, really, this is, this is Jesus' approach to, to say something like this. I trust, I trust my heavenly father. I trust his words. I trust his ways. And then it's as if like Satan keeps pushing and saying, is that your final answer? And Jesus says, yep, that's my final answer. I trust my heavenly father. Now, here's part of the reason why that still matters today, that Jesus was so obedient and trusting in the desert in Luke chapter four. Why does this matter? Because despite the onslaught from Satan, Jesus never sinned. Which means Jesus is qualified for a unique job. Jesus is qualified to represent people like us because he is the sinless son. He is qualified to represent us before a holy God. He is the sinless one to stand in our place. A substitute who's not paying for his own sins because he hasn't got any. He's paying, he can stand in the path of the wrath of God on our behalf to pay for our sins and our sins alone. We need a pure spotless lamb to stand in our place on our behalf to sort our sin. And as we look to the desert in Luke chapter 4, Jesus, who didn't give in to any of the temptations, is the one we need. He is the sinless one, qualified to stand in as our substitute. Now here's the last thing that we'll look at today, and I think theologically it's the trickiest thing that I've saved for last, with a couple of nice stories thrown in as well. So if you don't get all the words, listen to the stories and they should make a bit more sense. But it's really to deal with a question that people have. And here's the question. Were, were these temptations of Jesus real temptations? Because Jesus is God. Jesus is God. So how can these temptations be real for God in the flesh? And there's a second little question that goes along with this. Could, was, there, was there any possibility that Jesus could sin? Like we know he didn't sin, but was there any possibility that Jesus could sin? Thinking like if Jesus is, is God and he is God, then surely he cannot sin. So 
it goes back to the thing, were these real temptations at all? If he can't sin, then it doesn't seem like they're real temptations. Well, let's turn to Hebrews 4 and we'll see that Jesus, it just confirms that Jesus was really tempted. It's very clear in the Bible that from Luke 4 and Hebrews 4, Jesus was really tempted. We might not know how to fit that all together in our heads, but it's really clear that Jesus was really tempted. Hebrews 4 verse 15. Hebrews 4 verse 15. For we do not have a high priest. It's talking about Jesus, the high priest. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. This is Jesus, tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So it's really clear Jesus was tempted, just like we are. Big difference is, he didn't give in to any temptations. But going back to the question, were these real temptations for Jesus? Well, let's be honest, different Bible-believing, brainy, um, keen Christians would, would answer this question in a slightly, not, not always in the same way. So what do we do about that? You know, how are we going to answer this question? Well, let me lay, I'll just lay my cards on the table and I'll tell you where I land with this question. Now, I'm not saying you're going to totally agree with me, but I'll try and lay out a case and see if this is helpful. I hope so. And I'm, I'm really lining up with a, a theologian called Bruce Ware, who's written a, a great book called The Man Christ Jesus, which delves into these issues. So the answer goes something like this about the temptations of Jesus. To answer this question, why did Jesus not sin? Why did Jesus not sin? One way to answer this question, which is true, why he didn't sin? Because he is God. And to say with this, I... I believe that Jesus, as God, could not sin. He is God. He cannot sin. There's even a fancy word for that, and it's impeccability. Impe we have the word impeccable, impeccable. Well, if you can't, to say that Jesus could not sin is his impeccability. He cannot sin. And actually, that's a really wonderful thing, because it means that Jesus has always been good, was perfect when he was on the planet, and he always will be good. There's never a chance that he would get even slightly evil, which is, which is wonderful. He's just always going to be good. He's impeccable. Right. But I also have to agree with Hebrews 4 and Luke 4 that Jesus was really tempted. Tempted like we are as a person on this planet. But how? How could Jesus be tempted when he is God? And it's something to do with the mystery of God becoming man. And Jesus having vulnerabilities as a man. Now it's, it's clear in many other respects that Jesus had vulnerabilities as a man that, that God does not have. Vulnerabilities like Jesus got tired, he got thirsty, thirst, not thirst, Thursday, but thirsty. He got thirsty and he could be killed on a cross. Jesus was vulnerable and vulnerable to temptation as a man. And Jesus resisted temptation 
during his time on this planet and he did it exactly the way that we resist temptation on this planet. We look to God to give us strength. We look to God's Holy Spirit to empower, empower us to say no to temptation. Now, we, perhaps at the moment you can't fit all of that together in your head. So I've got a couple of illustrations or stories, if you like, that, that help me to fit all this together. How can Jesus be God, but also be vulnerable to temptation? Right. Well, here we go. First of all, the swimmer. So this is the swimmer story, which is a picture to help us to understand how Jesus fought, how Jesus fought temptation in his humanity as a man of flesh and blood who was vulnerable. Let's have a look. So imagine an amazing swimmer and they're trying to break the record for the longest continuous swim, which is something like about 70 miles. Now I've never even swum half a mile, but this is this amazing swimmer is going to try and swim at least 70 miles. And, and in this picture, Jesus is the amazing swimmer in his humanity. Right. Also in the picture, there is a boat and it's following right along behind if the swimmer gets into any trouble. But as it, as it turns out, the swimmer does not need the boat at all. The boat is there all the time, but the swimmer doesn't need it. Because this swimmer smashes the long distance swimming record, does the 70 miles and, and then a few extra miles as well. And triumphs and the, the crowds go mad. Now, why is it the swimmer didn't drown? Well, because the swimmer kept swimming on his own. Why couldn't he drown? Because the boat was always there. The boat was ready to rescue if anything went wrong. Now notice the, the boat was always there, but never helped the swimmer. The boat had nothing to do with the great achievement of the swimmer. And actually, if the swimmer had grabbed onto the boat for help at any point, then that would have forfeited the whole achievement. You know, you can't like say, I'm gonna swim 70 miles nonstop and then spend 10 minutes halfway through holding onto the boat. No. So the swimmer swam the whole distance on his, on his own. Right, the second image, the second story or picture or whatever is of a brilliant mathematician. Are you a brilliant mathematician? You're not gonna be as good as this one. This brilliant mathematician, and again, the person, the brilliant mathematician represents Jesus in his humanity. The mathematician sits at a, a, maths, sits a maths test and it's a calculator paper and there's a calculator on the desk to help this brilliant math student. Now the thing is, the brilliant math student gets 100% on the paper a perfect record, if you like. It's an amazing score, but what's really, really amazing is that he got 100% on the calculator paper without touching the calculator, without using the calculator at all. The calculator was in front of him all the time, but he never used it. He, he got a perfect score without using their help that was right there all the way through. Now there are two stories that are stolen from Bruce Ware and I've changed them around a little bit, but it's basically his, his stories. What's that got to do with Jesus? In Luke four, Jesus fought the toughest temptations perfectly 
as a man without using his own divine power. Even though Jesus is God in the flesh, he didn't use any of that of his own divine power to resist all of those temptations. Like the swimmer didn't use the boat, like the incredible mathematician didn't use the calculator, and yet they both smashed through it and came up with that perfect achievement at the end of things. In the same way, Jesus did not use his God abilities, his Godness, didn't use that to resist temptation, which is absolutely amazing. This is how Jesus resisted temptation. He looked to the power of the Holy Spirit for him to be able to say no to every single temptation. Just like we do. We look to God's power through the Spirit to say no to temptation. Jesus used all the things that are available to us. So Jesus was that tree planted by streams of water in Psalm 1, as in his life was saturated in the scriptures. Jesus regularly prayed to his Father in heaven like we can. Jesus trusted and obeyed his Father like we can. Jesus was a spirit-fueled person, just like we can be as Christians. In other words, Jesus had to fight every temptation, every time, using the exact same resources that we have as Christians. Peter was talking about Jesus in Acts chapter 10. It's worth looking at Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And Peter says about Jesus, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And God is with every Christian to help us to say no to every temptation. God is with every Christian, the same Holy Spirit who helped the Lord Jesus as a man, as a person, is the, the Spirit who helps us as people to say no to temptation. That means you. That means you have the Spirit's power to say no to temptation. Temptations that you may have given into time after time. How we need to look to the Spirit's power to say 